Hey church, Pastor Cody here, and I just want to say thank you for stopping by and joining us in worship today. And while we're super excited that you're hanging out with us for this message, we also want to remind you that this is really just um, a supplemental resource that cannot and will not replace the local church. So while um, we're, we're glad that you're here, while we're glad that you're encouraged and, and, and uh, challenged and shaped by the Word of God that's being preached today, we also want to um, let you know that this is really just a substitute and in no way should forsake the uh, gathering together of the local church body. We believe that the local church is God's plan A in speaking the gospel. So please come hang out with us here at rest um, this Sunday morning with us or um, go find another Bible-believing church. Jesus is preparing the church um, that's close to you um, and he's challenging you to get plugged in there. Um, Jesus loves the church and we love Jesus and we believe that we can love Jesus better by being locally connected and serving her well. So um, just jump right in with us and we're glad you're here. Amen. The bass is rolling. Heaven's rocking. Are you glad to be here this morning? All right. Hey, they told me uh, yesterday uh, coming into today that it's fall break or fall back actually seeing some social posts about that. And so, uh, Ted, they told me I could preach for an extra hour today, since y'all are giving that up, so buckle in. Um, man, I'm so glad you're here. I'm Adam. I'm one of the pastors. If you're new, I want to say uh, welcome, a big welcome to you. And I, I just wonder, I'm not sure if you've ever had this happen to you before or not, but if you've been to maybe a party or a family gathering or perhaps a Mexican restaurant... And in the center of the room, in the center of the table, what you usually find is a stack of chips and some queso. There's a shared community bowl of, of queso there, and everybody's having a great time, but then all of a sudden you notice there, that there's this one guy that is t- continues to take his half-bitten chip and return it to the shared community bowl of, of queso, and, and he's, after he's already taken a bite, and this is the dreaded double dipper. Have any of you seen the double dipper before? Well, what happens is that this one guy he usually ends up contaminating the rest of the bowl for everyone else. And for me, uh, we're close, but we ain't that close. You know, I'm super weird about uh, food. I'm picky when it comes to food in the first place. And maybe it's because I'm scarred. I've watched somebody t- open up a glass bottle of ketchup before, take out their butter knife, lick the butter knife, and then stir up the ketchup and go on and leave it on the table. Um, if I was dehydrating in the desert, I can promise you I'm not, still not drinking the backwash polluted water of my four-year-old <laughs> at all. And don't, Matt Quint, don't even get me started on buffets, right? If Pastor Cody was here, he'd have both hands up, amen, in that one, church. Uh, but I'm a little uh, weird uh, uh, about food, but this is just common sense, right? To not, not contaminate it for everyone else. Well, similarly to that double dipper that contaminates the bowl for, for everyone, in our text today, what we're going to see in the book of Romans is we're going to meet a guy, and he was at a party in paradise a long, long time ago, and his name is Adam, and it's Adam's sin that comparably uh, taints and affects every human being who would be born and come after him. And so if you have your Bible this morning, go with me to Romans chapter 5. We'll read together verses 12 through 14. Uh, this is week 37 of, of Romans, uh, 12 through 14. It's a tale of two atoms. And so I'll give you a second just to get there. Romans 5, 12 through 14. Uh, do you love Jesus Rest Church? Are you ready to study his word this morning? Romans 5, 12, or 12 through 14. This is God's word. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there's no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Now, if you've, you haven't been with us for the past uh, 36 weeks we've been camped out together in the book of Romans, and we've just finished talking about this benefits package that comes along with our justification, 
And uh, we've said that justification, this is when God makes this declaration over us, then, then he sees me, he treats me just as if I never sinned. Uh, Pastor Johan added to that last week that also it's as if I'll never sin again. And so Paul, our writer, what he's doing in this text is he's, he's starting to finish this conversation that he opened the lid up on way back in the beginning of chapter 4 of Romans uh, when he brought up Abraham and David and, and started to talk about justification. And so Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to the end, uh, uh, 21, it's this really uh, super complicated section. But it's also this really super critical section when it comes to you and I understanding what the gospel is. Because, right, it's in the gospel that we receive our justification. And this means all of a sudden now that you and I, we have went from enemies to family of God. We went from war at God to peace with him. And so that, that's great. But how does, how does that actually work? Well, what Paul's doing here is he's saying, here's the nuts and bolts of how justification actually works. Because what we see God do is we see him accomplish our standing shift, our status shift by way of a mediator. He does it through a covenant head. He sends a representative to represent us all. And this is where we get this title today from, the tale of two Adams. So it's it's two Adams. It's two covenants stacked against one another. It's a covenant of works standing against the new covenant of grace. And the covenant of works, we'll, we'll talk about that a little later today, but that's where we're, we're all represented by Adam and what Adam's done, we've done. Um, so he's the, he's the original double dipper because he became a rebel. We too now are rebels. And, and Paul really sets up all of, all of redemptive history through these two Adams, and the question at the end of every sermon we preach for the rest of Romans chapter 5 really boils down to this question, and the question is this, which representative are you under? Are you under the first Adam of Eden, or are you under the second Adam, the new Adam, the better Adam, Jesus, who's come from heaven? Because these are the only two options in how you and I can relate to God. And so really quickly, I want to give you two roadmaps, say two, two, I'm going to give you two roadmaps on where we're going, kind of a macro picture over the next few weeks, and then micro of what's happening today. So if you want to take your phone out or write this down, it'll help you work through the next set of sermons together. So um, in the tale of two Adams, here's what we're going to see overall. First, we're going to see the conflict, we're going to see the contrast, and then we're going to see the conclusion. So we're going to see the conflict, we're going to see the contrasts, um, that's trespass versus gift, condemnation and justification, death versus life, disobedience and obedience, and then the conclusion in 20 and 21 that Christ has overcome. That's where we're going for the next few weeks as we finish Romans 5. But for today, we're going to talk about just the conflict, just the conflict. And Paul lays it out like this sort of in his text, or what I can see from it. First, he's going to tell us about the problem. And then he's going to prove, or show us proof of the problem in verse 13, and then further proof of the problem in verse 14. So it's the problem, then proof of the problem, and further proof of the problem. And so what we have is Paul's introducing to us both Adam and Jesus. And this morning, you and I, we're going to sit down around the career of the first Adam, that it was Adam. He's the one that's responsible for bringing in sin and death into humanity. He's the one that has opened the door for the power and the curse of sin. And it sets the stage, church, for this type, this better one who will come in Christ. And, and so you might be like this morning, might be like, man, we're talking about problems Yay! <laughs> like, I got, I got enough problems. Like, hey, can, can we talk more about the queso, right, instead of the problems? Well, here, here's the reality of this. You can either frustratingly, continually rake the aftermath of leaves when it comes to your problems, or you can start to dig down at, at the roots and find out what the source really is because I don't know about you but for me I often find myself wondering man why is this why is this world so messed up 
Why is this world so jacked up? And I'm sure you've heard it before. Every generation sort of says it, right? They're like, you know, well, when I was a kid, things were different. And you hear that at first, and you're kind of like, yeah, whatever, dude. But, but then as you get older and you look back, you kind of go, you know what? Yeah, things were a little bit different when I was a kid than, than they are right now. And it's true, as evil continues to grow, as it continues to progress, we continue to grow, but we continue to regress in our sin. And you've seen this, if you've had your eyes open, right? There was a, a mass shooting in Maine, I think, last week. I don't have to tell you about Hamas and what's going on in, in Israel right now. You may not know this, but there are 32 active wars happening right now. There's poverty, there's pollution, there's pornography, there's death, there's famine, there's drug abuse. And so what do we do? What do we do? We usually, we usually point the finger out there, right? And so what we see, John, is we see the Democrats blame the Republicans. And then we see the Republicans blame the Democrats. And then everybody blames the independents, Ted, because they don't even know which side they're on, right? And then if you watch a lot of YouTube, you get, first it's a, 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 a Chinese conspiracy theory, and then it's a, a Russian conspiracy theory that's go on. And I'm just like, no, church, all of this points back to one singular person in one singular moment in time when Adam opened up this door, and as he opened up, death and destruction followed him through it. And so this is ultimately why destruction happens outside of us. This is ultimately why destruction happens inside of us sometimes. This is why babies die. This is why adults die. This is why bad things happen to people. This is why sometimes marriages don't work. This is why sometimes maybe you've had to attend multiple Christmases growing up like me. This is why your kids don't listen. This is why you don't listen. This is why I don't listen. And, and I'm not saying this to, to bring shame on anyone. I'm saying we've all got the carry-on baggage through Adam just in different ways. But if you've ever looked out at the world and thought, man, what in the world is going on? Then it's no mistake that you're here this morning. Because this is the root of all of it and all of its after effects. It's original human sin. And my hope for us is that by the end of our conversation in this text of Romans, we wouldn't just look at original sin as some cop-out thing that Christians point back to whenever devastation happens in our lives, but that we would see that original sin uh, explains the problem underlying all of the other problems. And these verses, man, they answer that age-old question for why we're in the mess that we're in. And so the primary principle we're going to keep in mind this morning is this. Uh, one guy can ruin everything. Ladies, you were right. It's all our fault. One guy can ruin everything. That's not it. I just thought that was funny. Or actually, what we're going to carry along in our main thought is this. What Adam did, we did. What Adam did, we did. And so really this text is a lot about the impact of one. Because I'm only one, but I am one. Right, one word, it can, it can change life. One match, it can uh, illuminate a house or it can ignite it. One makes a big difference. And so I'm going to pray for us and then we'll, we'll climb through this text, verses 12 through 14 together. If you would pray with me. Holy Spirit, we come and ask you to just move in this place, Lord, that you would, that you would come and teach us, God. Um, Lord, thank you, for, thank you for babies. Thank you for children, Lord, the great blessing they are uh, in our life. Help us to steward them well um, by, by giving worship to you, to show them who you are, Jesus. And thank you, God, for coming and doing what the first Adam just couldn't do, what we couldn't do, for reconciling us to yourself. Jesus, we love you. I rebuke Satan and demons from this place. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Now, what I didn't tell you earlier on uh, about this text is that it's, it's really confusing in how it's written. And so I want to lay out just a couple more preliminaries for us um, before we take our trip down this road. Because I don't want you to swerve off of it as we're taking turns in the text. And so I'll, t I'll start by pointing out just a couple words to you. So look at your Bibles. Um, the word one, say one. 
the power of one. It shows up 13 times, uh, 13 times in the ESV at least. I think I counted right. You may check the math on that. Um, but it's, it's, this, it's this story of really two ones. It's one man, one choice, one sin, one trespass that leads to death. And then there's another one who would come bringing one gift, one act of righteous obedience that would lead to life. These two ones are further illustrated in this word reign. Say reign. With one, death would reign. With one, life and grace would reign. And then lastly, we see uh, some much more. Say much more. And these much mores are so great because they are a stage to remind you and to remind me that we have gained much more than we could have ever lost in Adam. And this is some incredibly good news. Now, you'll you'll probably have to actually look at your Bible to understand this next part. But if you look at the sentence structure of Romans 5, 12 through 21, what you'll notice in verse 12 is that Paul starts a sentence that he doesn't actually complete until he gets to around verse 18. And so his opening words there are, Therefore, just as sin entered the world. But if you read the rest of Romans 5, The corresponding words we expect Paul to say after this statement is something like, uh, so also, much more, therefore, in the same way. But that doesn't follow um, the same sentence structure of verses 18, 19, and 21. Instead of what Paul does is he lays out verse 12, he breaks off of his argument from verse 12 in order to explain or prove or justify what he's just said in verse 12 with verses 13 and 14. And so let's read all of this together, all of verse 12 together. Paul's going to that Paul's going to prove in 13 and 14. And just as a heads up, verse 12 is going to be 98 99% of the conversation today. Okay? Verse 12. So let's read all of this together. What Adam did, we did. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. This is the problem. Now, in order for you and I to understand this problem, we first have to get to know the source, the roots of the problem. This one man, this one man who took the tortilla chip of humanity, Pastor John, and dipped it in on behalf of the rest of us. We need to get to know Adam. And so, meet Adam. This isn't me, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. Meet Adam. We meet Adam in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, in Genesis 2-7, and it'll be up on the screen, I won't read it, but what happens in Genesis 2-7 is that God creates Adam, he, from the dust, the soil, the dirt of the ground, he forms him, he fashions him, by intelligent design, Adam is created in the image of God, God breathes his own breath into Adam, it probably sounded a little like that, right? We love, man, we love babies here. God breathes into Adam. Adam comes into life. And just as a really quick side note here, this is not a metaphorical Adam. This is not a metaphorical Adam. And we're not going to deep dive in this, but two really easy, quick, basic arguments of this. Number one, um, behind intelligent design is the thinker. Behind the thinker is the thought. Behind the thought is a mind. And behind a mind is a being. That's number one. Number two, if it's literally the historical second Adam who is Jesus that comes to redeem us of our sin, then it must be a literal literal historical Adam from Eden that condemns all of us. And so, anyway, the the essence of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 is this, that when God speaks, things change. When God speaks, things happen. And we see that early on in the story of creation as God speaks things into creation. This also, Adam, or God speaks, Adam form, is formed from the dirt. Uh, moms, this tells us why little boys are dirty all the time. This tells us why they love every mud puddle they can find, Maggie. Uh, they're just trying to get back to their roots, all right? They're born in Adam. So, anyway, Adam is an actual historical person. He's created without sin, in perfection, in the image of God, by God. And his name means mankind. Mankind. 
He's a kind of a man. He represents all of mankind. And we are all descendants from Adam. Well, the scripture tells us that, that God then takes Adam. He puts him in a perfect garden called Eden, um, which means a place of pleasure. This is paradise. And sin hasn't entered into humanity yet. And in this garden, it's Adam's job to work the garden. It's Adam's job to tend the garden. It's Adam's job to love the garden. Um, and the same is true for us guys. It is your job to tend and to love and to uh, work for and alongside the people and things that God has placed under your stewardship. And so in this garden, God uh, it, it gives to Adam one. Say one. One. One command is the power of one. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it'll be on the screen. Here's the command. God commanded Adam, can eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil shall not eat. From the day that you eat, you shall surely die. And so here's the picture of paradise that's uh, painted for us. That it's a, it's a grace garden. It's a garden of grace with one law tree. It's God's grace garden with one law tree. And so God says to him, hey, and if you eat from this tree, you will surely die instantly, spiritually, later, physically. God then goes and, and he cre uh, goes on to create a helper for Adam. Because um, ladies, we, all of us men, we need help. Right, Ted? We all need help. If it, Ted, if it wasn't for my wife, Laura, I would never find any condiment in the fridge ever. Um, and I don't say that in a denigrating way. Uh, my life would be much less joyous and significantly more difficult without my beautiful wife. All the married guys said, amen, amen right? Um, but ladies, you're a helper in the same way uh, that Eve was a helper to Adam. You're a helper in the same way that God the Holy Spirit is a helper um, to us. This is an honor. This is a title. This is a blessing and that you ladies share with God that us guys, we just don't. So... In Eden to this point, everything's perfect, everything's good, the party's rocking. Adam and Eve, they're flourishing over creation in dominion that God has given them. But then we get to Genesis chapter 3, and Satan shows up in the form of the serpent in God's garden. And he goes on alongside God to preach a false sermon to Eve. After God has just said, he's just spoken, he's had seven plus let there be's. He's just said, he's just spoken about the law. Satan comes in and goes, hey, did God really say, did God really say if you eat of this tree that you will surely die? This can't be true. Then from Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and all of the other uh, flannel graph art illustrations we've had growing up, we know that they believed the one lie, they ate the fruit, and so verse 12, Romans 5, sin came into the world through one man. Now if you know the story, you know that technically Eve is the one who ate the fruit first. She's the one who offered it to her husband Adam. While Adam was with her, doing nothing, saying nothing, not leading his family well, he did not step up. And as a result, Satan has undermined the word of God. And all of a sudden, there's brokenness that enters into the family dynamic for the first time in history. And Adam and Eve, then as a result of their sin, they, they run away from God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. Because that's what sin makes us do. It brings fear, it brings guilt, it brings shame. And we want to run away from God. And so God comes walking in the garden, and when I read that, I always wonder what that sounds like. God comes walking in the garden, and, 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 and they've broken the covenant of works that, that God has established with Adam. And God holds this one man, Adam, responsible for what's happened. Look at who he comes looking for, Genesis 3, 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, I've got to do this. Where are you? That, that's what he says, right? He says, Adam. He says, where are you? And this is such a great question. Such a great question for us that God asks many of us guys. Men, where, where are you? 
When it comes to leading your family spiritually, men, where are you? When it comes to loving them well, where are you when it comes to taking responsibility for yourself and then also for your family? Are you providing? Are you tending? Are you loving them well? Because God is asking some of us men that are here and with church online this morning, he's going, bro, where are you at? And it's not that God doesn't know where you are. He knows exactly where you are. It's that he's asking the question because he wants you to think about the answer to that, that question. Are you in the place you're supposed to be doing the things you're supposed to be doing? Or are you following in the footsteps of the first Adam? And I point out this part of the story specifically because this is really the diving board for you and I when it comes to understanding what a covenant head is supposed to do. Because while it is true that everyone who sins against a covenant is responsible, the head is primarily and firstly held responsible for protecting, for obeying the terms of the covenant. This doesn't mean, ladies, this doesn't mean that the, that the husband's the boss and the wife is the employee. That's not the picture. It's a singular headship. You have been created as co-equals. It's plural leadership. You lead together. But the man takes responsibility first, just as Jesus takes responsibility for the church. The father takes responsibility for the family. And so when Adam and Eve break the law of God together, this covenant of work, sin enters into the world, into humanity, and this is like the ultimate, bro, you only had one job. It's a grace garden, one law tree. He only had one job. And, and, and what I want you to see through this is that this headship Adam has, it's bigger than just headship with Eve. Adam has headship with humanity. Look again at verse 12. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Adam, mankind, was created by God. as He was created as the head of humanity. And theologically, this is sometimes called the federal head. Say federal head. And what Paul's getting at for us is that Adam did something that the rest of us have to pay the price for. And uh, this isn't Paul's most popular idea. But Paul's bringing this double dipper in the forefront for you and for me, because there's something that he believes, man, about what Jesus has accomplished, and he's using the Adam story, he's telling the Adam story to make the point. And so it's the part about Jesus that Paul is really, really interested in. I'm just bringing the background to it so you can know the story. But Paul, he's starting with Adam because he wants you and I to understand how this applies to everyone. It's not just to Eve, and it's not just to Israel. Adam's sin has implicated every other human being who would ever be born. What Adam did, we did. Now, now remember I said that this, this section, it's kind of it's complicated, but for us to appreciate it, I'm going to give you just a little more background on, 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 on federal head, what they actually do, because when it comes to Western Christianity, when it comes to Western culture, um, it, it's hard for us to understand this idea of headship because we live in a, an individualistic, uh, isolated me centered, there's no uh, I in team, but there is in win culture. That's who we are, right? And so it's hard for us to understand this idea of headship sometimes. And so we might go like, what does this really, what is this one guy's decision that he made a long time ago, what does it have anything to do with me? And the answer is everything. It has everything to do with you. The Latin word that's used for um, that's used here for the uh, federal headship, it comes from the word covenant. Say covenant. And covenant is the Bible's language uh, to explain how different relationships bind us together as one. And in covenant, God always sees us as part of the collective. He sees us as a family. He sees us as a group. And in each covenant that's brought up, there's always a head of the covenant. And, and we, as we said, it's the head's responsibility to make sure that everyone under the covenant is cared for and that the terms of the covenant is kept. This is, this, so this is, this is pretty simple to understand. Adam, he's the head of the human race. 
the federal head, and he's been handed this covenant in the same way Jesus has to the church. But over and over and over again in the scriptures, we see, we see this idea of God. He's establishing covenants all throughout the Old Testament. But the first covenant we ever see show up early on in the book of Genesis is that covenant of work. Say covenant of work. God made this covenant with Adam and Eve. We've already read it. He made this covenant with Adam and Eve on behalf of the whole world. And in this covenant of works, God, uh, God had set before them the promise of blessing. He told Adam, he told Eve, he, he told them they could eat of the tree of life and, and live forever if they were obedient. But he also told them that they could not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil or they would surely die. And so what's happened is that, that, that what's happened is that Surrounded in this garden, it's surrounded with this structure of an agreement. It's this promise from God of either blessing or destruction, depending on how they performed. That's why it's called a covenant of works. And the point of distinction for us in this is that Adam and Eve failed in their covenant of works as they ate the fruit. And when that failure took place, God didn't look in and just wipe everybody out, those two, in that moment. But instead, he adds to that covenant a promise of redemption that would come through the seed of the woman later with a much better Adam. And like, I get it. We, we hear this and it's kind of confusing. Or, or if we hear it and we understand it, we squirm just a little bit because it's like, hold on, hold on. You're telling me this one guy that I didn't vote for, that I didn't elect, he sinned, he transgressed, he broke the covenant of works, he ate the fruit salad, and the price the rest of us have to pay for is we share in his loss, we share in his guilt, his sin is our sin? Well, that's not fair. And, and just by the way, if, if that's your mentality, it just further proves Paul's point in this whole passage. But Adam was the federal head. He represented us all. And so what Adam did in the garden wasn't just for himself, but it was for all those whom he represented. And, and I've said this already, but the Bible sees us uh, as humans in, in a human kind of solidarity. And so uh, we have a representative before us. That's what a representative does. They represent us. And we understand this. You're more familiar with it when, than you think you are. Uh, today, there's going to be some NFL games, and two captains are going to walk to the center of the field, and they're going to do a coin toss. And whoever wins and whoever lo- loses is going to win or lose on behalf of their team to who gets the ball or defers. Or in, in a trade union, someone is given the right to negotiate and sign a contract on behalf of the union members. Whenever a defendant comes and enters into an agreement with a legal counsel, a lawyer that that, that represents them in court, that person all of a sudden has the power of the dominion of attorney to speak on behalf of that person. And we could go on and on and on with this, right? The president, he's an elected leader. He can declare war. He can declare peace. A CEO makes the decisions for the company. A father makes decisions that impacts the family. There's a lot of power in the power of one. But how is this fair? How is this fair of God to pick Adam? And two last things on this. Number one, right, you did not pick Adam, but God picked Adam. And so what this means is there's not a place in time or in space where you and I have been more perfectly represented than in the Garden of Eden by the representative that God elected. And so you and I, we can't puff up and raise up and say, you know, I would have, I would have made a better pick than, than God would have. Number two, secondarily, God didn't just pick Adam, though. God created Adam to be our federal head. Adam, he was perfectly designed to act exactly as you would personally, individually, would have acted in the same situation. Paul, Paul's saying Adam's our federal head. He's our representative because he acted exactly how we would have acted individually in that moment. And, and what he brings in with him in this action is called original human sin. Original sin. This is a doctrine that people have loved to hate for a long, 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 long time. 
But make no mistake, you have descended from your father Adam, and so ethically and morally, you act like him. And we know this, we've seen this on a really small, basic human level, right? Whenever, whenever someone comes and says, hey, they, that kid, they act just like their dad. Or like grandma says, you act just like your daddy does. And we, we inherit certain characteristics, certain traits from our parents, from our grandparents. We, we inherit eye color. We inherit hair color. We inherit height and, and, and different things of, of the nature. And it's like, yeah, because the kid belongs to, to, to them. And in the same way from Adam, we've received spiritual, immaterial genetics, and we inherit this fallen nature. Verse 12, because all sinned. And when Paul says this here, he, 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 when he's saying this, he's saying that the entire human race, not only did we inherit sin, but that we also sinned in this one single past action along with Adam. That's why he says all. Paul isn't saying that, look, people all die because we're just like Adam, that we sin like he does, but because we're all in Adam, and when he sinned, so did we. What Adam did, we did. You and I, we're not just sinners because uh, we, we sin. We sin because we are sinners. It's not just what we do. It's who we are, apart from Jesus Christ. That's us and Adam. That's Adam and us. And, and so here's next what, what, this, what this one action, what it brings along with it. It brings along this progression, this chain reaction of sin and death and destruction for everybody. Can you guess what verse it is? 12. Right. Verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came, Adam sins. And all of a sudden, the peace of the garden, the shalom of the garden, of the original created order of Eden, is disrupted forever whenever Adam and Eve exalt themselves as gods over God along with the serpent. God then in return pronounces a curse, and that curse has impacted everybody and everything ever since. And what Paul's arguing here, I think, is that both sin and death are universal to every human being. And so this is, the, this is the doctrine of imputation in its worst possible manifestation. Adam's sin is reckoned, it is transferred, it is imputed into us, into the entire human race. And so this means that everyone who is born is born sin, S-I-N, positive. And it was an act of sin, but also this act that brought along with it a power that unleashed a, a reign of terror. And the progression of sin was this. Sin leads to death and its power over us. Verse 12, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin. This verse, church, it tells us where human death comes from. Adam's sin brings about the original human death. When Adam's sin, it separated, it cut us off, it broke the covenant between us and God. And that's what happens anytime that you separate yourself from the source of life. If I have a cord plugged in and I cut it off in the middle, the power is dead. And so this death that shows up for us, it's at least threefold. It's a spiritual death, it's a physical death, and it's an eternal death. It's a spiritual death, it's a physical death, it's an eternal death. It's a spiritual death meaning that, the, that we are born spiritually dead instantly. But also that one day we will be separated, we will be cut off from our bodies and we will all physically die. And then number three, if you are not in Christ Jesus, that you will be cut off eternally from the presence of God and spend an eternity in hell separated from him. And so just as Adam opens up this door to walk through, what follows through with him in the sin is death and destruction. And this is the consequence of his disobedience. And we see it supported in the scriptures in all sorts of places. Romans 6.23 says, for the wage of sin is what? Death. Uh, James 1.15, it says when sin grows up, when it's fully conceived, uh, it brings forth Death. Ephesians 2 1. You are dead in your trespasses and your sin. Do you see this connecting theme? When sin shows up, death always follows it. Adam sinned, we sinned. Adam died, so we will all die because what Adam did, we did. 
And we know, we know death, it's not a respecter of persons, right? It comes for, for every single person. It's a power that none of us can escape, short of Jesus Christ returning to snatch us up. Death, it comes knocking on your door, not just because you sin. Death comes knocking on your door because you are a sinner by nature, and this is called depravity. And in our depravity, it's not, our depravity isn't the result of our sinning. It's the cause of our sinning. You were born physically alive, but spiritually dead in Adam. Death is what's in you, and it's what naturally comes out of you because it's who you are. You have been inherited being born to die, and it affects everyone. Verse 12 again, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Death spreads to all men. Spiritual death, physical death, eternal death. And and let me remind you of this chain reaction again. I'll just read it. The the three-stage chain reaction, the three-stage progression that shows up. Sin enters, death follows it, and sin has spread. And here's the bottom line. You're like, I wish you would have said this 25 minutes ago. Adam just blew it for everybody. Adam blew it for everybody. And next, quickly, Paul's going to convince us of what he said in verse 12 is true. This will be real quick. Here's the problem proved, part one, verse 13. You're like, finally, yes. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was was given. And so Paul, he brings the law into this equation because it's what his Jewish readers were thinking of anyway. They were using it as a standard of determination in identifying sin. And they're going, where, where does the law fit into all of this? And part of Paul's point is that it doesn't. He, he plainly says there, sin was committed even before the law of Moses, the written law, was given. And so this is obvious. We know this, right? Men have been committing sins since Adam's disobedience in the garden. Adam came before Moses was there. And so with Adam came sin. And and so Paul, I think he's saying this to reinforce this idea about the universality of death. Because there were some Jews who believed that there could be no death or sin apart from the law. So let let me just ask you, when there was no written law, Did the people before the law, did they just avoid sin? Of course not. Of course not. Paul says, in fact, it was in the world before the law. And then he adds to that, the second part of 13, but sin's not counted where there's there's no law. Okay, so if sin isn't counted where there is no law, and there was no written law before God gave the commandments to Israel, We still have the covenant of works that Adam's broken. We still have the moral law that God has written on our heart. And and so Paul's going, hey, when there's no law there, there's no law to break. You know, you see this in games. There's no uh, flag to throw if there's no foul. And this phrase, it's not really straightforward, but here's what I, I take this to mean, is that there was sin in the world before the law, the written law was given, even though... It was not technically specified as a violation of a revealed commandment. And so, all of that to say, Paul's first proof of his problem, he's just going, look, sin has been here even before the written law came. And then lastly, very quickly, verse 14, it supports this idea further. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Paul's proof of this, that death has reigned uh, between Adam, from Adam to Moses. He's saying everyone still died between these two, right? Uh, Cain died, Abel died, Noah died, Abraham died, Isaac died, Jacob died. Most everybody died. And so if death is a result of sin, sin has been there from the beginning, before the written law, ever since Adam double-dipped it into humanity, and it reigned over them just like it reigns over us. Look at the second part of that verse. Even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. And this is meaning that death reigned over those who didn't break the written law because death showed up and still held them responsible for being sinners. And, and, And so... 
you could put the logic of this statement like this. Death, disease, however you want to phrase it. Death, it, it reigns over just as much over nice people as it does over mean people. Death, it, it reigns just as much over ignorant people as it does instructed people. Death reigns over infants who haven't deliberately disobeyed just as much as it does over adults. Sin entered, death followed, sin reigned, death reigned, and death spread to everyone. And it still does today as we experience the catastrophic aftermath of this moment. And so the proof of the problem part two for Paul is this. Every one of us is under the penalty of sin because when we look at history, what do we see? People die. People die. Death reigns because all sinned in and through Adam, the representative of us all. And so church, what I need you to know this morning is that, that death, sin, that sin is not natural. It is our enemy. Death, it is not natural. It is our enemy, but it has a reign over us. And you need to know that it has not been birthed from God, but that it has been birthed from sin. And I don't know if you know this or not, but every second, two people die. That's 120 deaths a minute. 7,200 deaths per hour, that's north of 172 to 2,000 deaths per day. And whenever the clock, when it stops ticking in our life, we don't know how to face it. And so what we do is we sometimes put death in a box and we dress it up so it doesn't look so deadly. So we put makeup and we put clothes on it. Or sometimes we close the box so we don't have to stare death directly in the face. Billions of people have experienced this. One out of every one of you in this room will experience this. Death is built into us like a fuse, and when the clock hits zero, it will burn the house down. Do you understand that death is your enemy? That's what he says, verse 14. Yet death reigned from Adam, but also, listen to this, Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Adam, the first one who got us all into this mess. He also points forward to a second Adam, the one who would come to get us out of it. Adam is the source. Jesus is the remedy. And so, church, the overarching application of this is that every one of us, we are either in Christ or we are in Adam. These are the only two options. It's no mistake Paul reemphasizes that word one there because he's, he's pointing out our identification is with one of the two. It is with our father Adam or it is with Jesus Christ. Because look, the book of Romans, man, it's not just telling us what happened back in Genesis. It's telling us what always happens all of the time. We are sinners and we sin and because of sin, we all deserve death. And so what you and I need is we need someone to come in our place. We need a new representative to show up because we have fallen into this pit of death that we cannot get out of ourselves. And the gospel, it stands as our only hope because every sinner needs a Savior because of what Adam did, we did also. And we've all fallen into this pit. 